day, folks. Hope everybody's doing okay. Uh, kind of want to start with a couple of things. So, um, again, I'm sorry about last week, but uh, that's what I come home with. I got me a 40 foot by eight and a half foot, or excuse me, seven and a half foot. Well, it's eight foot on the outside. School bus from Columbia, South Carolina. And I have begun uh, renovating it. We've got all the seats. We spent the weekend getting all the seats out. And uh, that was the roughest part. The rubber's off. And uh, now we're starting to put back a little bit. We're going to start with insulation. And the uh, first thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to take some uh, aluminum foil like Reynolds Wrap. We're going to spray uh, adhesive to all the metal parts on the inside of the bus and uh, then just put uh, like Reynolds wrap around it with a shiny side out and that gives us a radiant barrier to uh, take care of the uh, radiation heat and then we're going to put insulation on it and uh, then we'll start doing our finish work and stuff. We got to figure out what what all electric stuff we're going to be putting into it and uh, getting all of that taken care of before we hide everything so it's going to be a it's going to be definitely a uh, a voyage just in uh, renovating the, the thing and uh, what i'll do when i get off of here i'll uh, i'll share the uh, my photo album with you on that and you guys can follow along on my schoolie build so uh, a couple of things first uh if you'll notice on the Moodle site, I've put down uh, somewhere there. I've put down, it's in the first section. I've put down the lab groups. Uh, I've got four spots for Tuesday, five spots for Thursday. First come, first serve, give me a text. Uh, this is what I have thus far. These are the people that have, have answered me. So uh, I have, if I've heard from anybody else, I'm, I'm overlooked it. So, you know, if you don't see your name there, remind me and I'll, uh, I'll put you on whichever day you can, you can, uh, that I can. I'd like to keep it to eight people a day. Uh, we got, we got, uh, no, it's nine people a day. Is that right? How many people we got in this class? I don't even know. I may have had my numbers wrong. Yeah, we got 18 people. So. I'm wrong on that. Uh, so I've got uh, five spots on Tuesday and six spots on Thursday. So I apologize for that. So it's we're going to have nine people per uh, lab. Eric? Yes. Could I uh, ask you to put the Zoom link on the top of this page also, like we did on the? Oh, yeah, OK class i was just i was just digging in my email and got the wrong link again okay all right so i thought i had done all that but yep thank you for reminding me Okay, there you go. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, I hope you spent last time looking through Mike Haddock's stuff here. He's uh, He's been around for a very, very long time, uh, veteran Mason. And uh, also, uh, if you've got any questions about any of this, post them right there and I'll try to answer them. What I want to do today is to I've, I've, I've you know I've went through and I've looked at some of these videos and I've uh, I've tried to fix all of the uh, problem videos. I don't know something about the History Channel or Discovery Channel. They change their their links ever so often in Facebook, so I've got to stay on that a little bit better. But I think I've got everything taken care of now. 
Um, so going back through some of these, I've missed a couple of things that I think is important and I want to kind of talk about them today. First, I want to give you guys a little bit of humor. So this is what happens when the troweling machine gets away from you. The commentary is almost as good as watching the action. If you just not shake when you're laughing. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to, you know, this is a handheld version, but look at this one here. This little sucker right there, that is a ride along, you know. Uh, so it actually has two fans down here that that go around, and I'm going to talk about that for just a minute. Uh, so before I get started, I wanted to kind of go through some of the control joints that I missed the other day. So we've got several different types. We've got tooled. We've got uh, a saw cut and we've got isolation columns. Uh, and then we, we did talk about the floating slab a little bit. So uh, in that, let me, let me go into depth a little bit more on that. So the, uh, get rid of my little panel here. So if somebody sends me a, a chat or something, holler at me because I'm getting ready to make the, the little meeting control thing go away. So let's say that we're talking about a huge industrial type building, uh, metal uh, building that has a whole bunch of columns in it. And these columns, and you'll have the, you know, you'll have these columns on the outside as well, and they'll have them ever so often. Most of the time these are like metal buildings. Uh, a lot of times these are made of, uh, you know, they can be made of, of six by sixes, eight by eights, 12 by twelves, or when you get on into the larger ones, then they, they're going to be made out of um, metal. They'll be uh, either a W beam or an S beam. And, uh, you know, they, all these columns here. So because this weight is the way it is, we want to isolate these, uh, these columns so that if the weight of the building is... Uh, distributed across the ground, uh, then, you know, we've got this separate, the, uh, the slab is going to be a little separate from the, the, the structure. And then we're going to put a control joint in between all of these. Now, what are we looking at? Let's, let's, uh, let's cut through this and we're going to be looking in that direction. So 
we have this huge, huge footing. This footing here most of the time is like five by five by five. I mean, it's enormous. And inside of this is uh, just a, well, it's called a cage. And you can, you can buy what is known as a helical. That's a helical. Uh, show you a picture of that. Helical, helical rebar. So helical rebar, uh, well, that just gives you a couple of pictures, but I was wanting a photograph. Of course, I don't ever get a photograph. There we go. So there is a cage. This is These are huge cages that are going to be used for columns. But basically, this is one great big long piece of rebar that's going out through there that they put in a helical in this form. In other words, it's, you know, it's going across through there like that. And we put that inside of this concrete. Remember that concrete is very strong in uh, compression. but it is very weak in tension. So we have to add uh, metal reinforcement to this uh, in order for it to give it the tension that it needs. And remember that concrete is very, uh, it's very static, meaning that it's not flexible. So uh, we also have to, you know, when we're putting in when we're doing like beams and stuff, we got to put uh, different types of, of metal reinforcement in there so that we we take, you know, allow for that bending and flexing a little bit. And this is all, you know, these are all tied together with rebar ties. And rebar ties are, um, you can get them in several different types. Uh, you can get them in the big coil, which you're going to have to have a, uh, a pair of pliers to wire this together and you'll end up with something that looks kind of like that. Or you can buy these uh, pre-engineered uh, wire ties and you use a, a little tool like this uh, to, to just, you know, basically you pull these two loops together and then this has a swivel on it. This, this thing goes roundy roundy and you hook that in there between these two holes and just blah, blah, blah and that uh, ties that together. When we start our labs, I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, by the way, I want you guys uh, to look up, what do you call a person who does rebar? Uh, what is that person called? Don't blurt it out. I just want you to just hang in there and uh, look that up before, it's over, before class is over with. I want you guys to be able to tell me what that is. So uh, look that up. What is a person called that works in rebar? Uh, and so there's tons and tons of different, uh, you know, different methods of tying. And you can see from here, you know, different types of methods that are used to tie all this together. We don't, these, these ties are junk. I mean, they're nothing. Uh, you, matter of fact, if you over tighten the uh, over tighten these these things, they'll break. Uh, they're only there as a temporary thing until you get your concrete poured. Uh, after that, they're not they're useless at all. So uh, when we're doing rebar, we have to make sure. Let me just give you a simple picture here. Right, when we're doing rebar, we have to make sure that that rebar stays a minimum distance of three inches from outside uh, edges of the concrete. And there's a perfect example of this uh, from Charlotte. Charlotte Motor Speedway had a bridge collapse. So uh, this is, I was trying to find a bigger picture. There you go. So this is what happened. I mean. This is at the motor, Charlotte Motor Speedway. This is a parking lot. Over here is the speedway. And people were crossing over this bridge 
as it collapsed. Uh, so this was not cool. Well, what happened? What caused this? Uh, they they came back and they did some in, some investigation and found out that this bridge, which goes over a highway, had a lot of corrosion because this was not being applied very good. They didn't, you know, they didn't pay attention to this. Some of the rebar was not covered and it was exposed to the elements. Well, what caused this was, well, salt and slag. So the, the, the like I say, this was a highway down here. And uh, as they were, you know, as snow or ice or whatever was being, uh, you know, I'm sorry, salt and, and slag was being applied to this road to keep water from freezing and everything, cars going up and down it. So you get spray and this stuff got up on the bridge there and it started eroding these pieces of rebar until they were nothing and then boom, that's what you got. Uh, that was not cool. It hurt a lot of people that night. And uh, so, it, you know, we really, really, really got to pay attention to make sure that our rebar is completely and totally uh, engulfed in that. Now they have, uh, DOT has changed some of their requirements on the rebar now. And all rebar has to be coated. Uh, it has to be coated and you'll see it in green. It's got a little plastic coating all over this rebar. And so whenever they do uh, bridges and stuff now, then uh, they have to have all coated stuff so they don't uh, rust. Any other time I would, let me just do rebar, geez. Sometimes I wanna to get too carried away here and I'm not seeing any of that. Here we go. So there you go, there's a bridge. Now look at all this rebar in there. I mean, we ain't just we don't have just a, a layer. We've got multiple mats. It's going, e it's going each way. Generally, these are like eight inches apart. And you'll see a note on the, on the plans that says, you know, number six, number seven rebar uh, at uh, eight inches uh, each way. So what did I just say? Uh, number, what, what did that do? So rebar is sized uh, in eighths of an inch. And so when you see a number on here, like a number four rebar, number four is placed over eight. And then we go it down to the you know lowest common denominator. And that's how big that piece of rebar is. A number four is a half an inch. Number six is three quarter. Um, number five would be five eighths and so forth and so forth and so forth. So an engineer is going to determine what size is going to be adequate enough for here. And then, you know, it will tell you how many layers it has to have, how many mats. Uh, and what I mean by mat is, you know, this makes up a woven mat. And all of these little buggers, they got to be tied together. At every intersection, these are going to be tied together. So they don't move when we pour the, the concrete. Uh, I would not want to be the person to have to lay all this stuff down. I mean, that's just, that's incredible. Just a lot of work. Nat, one of the reasons that you, you know, you see, uh, they're, what is it? They're building a, or they're redoing a bridge up at Asheville on I-40 now. Uh, you know, anybody that's driven up and down I-26 for the past freaking 40 years, I mean, it's just like an ongoing thing with them. I don't know why they didn't put a third lane in there years ago, uh, you know, I was driving that highway back in the 90s, and it's it was just as bad then as it is now. So, um, you know, who knows? Go figure it out. So in, in a house, we don't necessarily do a whole lot of huge rebar stuff. We've got, uh, we use, you know, a number four rebar is required in our footings. 
So there's the foundation wall. And generally, you know, an imaginary line goes down through there and that's where we put our rebar. And this runs continuously, continually across uh, around the footing of the house. The reason that we have to have this is because we have uh, differential settling in, in our soils here. You know, we live in Western North Carolina and, you know, there may be a big old granite rock over here and there may be a little pocket of what's called feldspar. And feldspar is a, is a very soft, sandy type soil uh, that collapses basically when you put weight on it. So, you know, we've got something that's kind of weak over here. We've got something strong over here and we've got, you know, different forces uh, or we've got the same forces being applied, but we've got, you know, little forces here. We've got huge forces over here and we may have medium forces here. And so if we don't put this rebar in here, then, you know, somewhere right around here, we're going to get a crack and then this could, you know, potentially break in half and we have a problem. And that's the reason for the rebar in that. Um, when we have just uh, the piers, so when I say a pier footing, you know, it's kind of like what I was talking about a minute ago with the, the industrial thing. We've got that pier footing, which is just a square thing. And inside of it, we're going to have uh, number fours at eight inches, uh, O-C-E-W, and that means each way. So number four rebars at eight inches on center each way, meaning that we're going to have, we're going to basically be making a mat in here as well, uh, and these will be tied, and this just goes across the bottom. And uh, so we'll have them going in both directions. It looks like just a mess there, but anyway. So this is generally about three to four inches up, uh, three inch being minimum, so we don't wanna go bare minimum, three, three to four inches up from the bottom. And the reason, because we put it on the bottom is this is what's gonna be in tension. This, we've got the forces being applied to it here. And if it tries to bend, then the top of it is going to be in compression and the bottom of it's going to be in tension. And then these are going to be pulling at each other so that, uh, you know, they, they don't. And also, you noticed how they look. Um, let me get another picture of rebar. They're also known as deformed bar. Uh, you see all these ridges on there. Oh, excuse me, <clears throat> those are put on there so that concrete holds or adheres to this bar. You can imagine that if we had if we had a rebar in here that didn't have any, you know, there's just a slick bar, then as this pushes down, concrete's just going to slide right off of this bar and it's not going to, it's not going to do any tension at all. So we, this is also, like I say, this is also known as deform bar. When we're talking about slabs, we had that uh, monolithic slab. And we have the floating slab. Both are used on a house. This is a uh, slab on grade. You'll hear it called. And then we have the floating slab. And this uh, this is also what I was starting to talk about as, as far as putting an isolation uh, beam or isolation uh, footing on there. So when we're doing this type, uh, we'll use different types of rebar or metal reinforcement in here. Again, we're going to put those two number four rebars uh, in here in the footing, same as we did here, all the way around the foundation perimeter. Uh, and then in the floating slab and in the 
uh, slab on grade or the monolithic slab. Uh, we're going to put what is known as woven wire mesh or woven wire fabric, welded wire fabric or woven wire mesh. W what is that? It's 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 uh, it's sized six six. Sorry, not six by six, six six ten ten uh, WWF WWM. One of the two of those. What does that six by six by? Uh, 10, 10 mean, that means that these are six inches by six inches. This is a 10 gauge and this is a 10 gauge. And it is uh, just placed in the, in the concrete. I knew that was going to come up. Well, maybe I'm putting it in wrong. Maybe it was 10 by 10. There we go. So I did put it in wrong. It's 10 by 6 by 6, 10, 10, woven wire mesh. And uh, I think I did hit on this a little bit. Uh, you know, the roll is going to, you roll it out. It comes back at you with, with full regards, uh, ready to impale you. Those ends are very super, super sharp. So if you want to, you know, if you want to do a really good job by the mats, uh, the there's five by 10 uh, panels and they're much safer to use. They don't get tangled up in the concrete truck if the concrete truck has to pull out here as well. But that is absolutely filled all the way around it. Also, we have uh, we've put plastic down uh, known as a PVB, which is polyethylene vapor barrier, polyethylene vapor barrier, PVB. Generally, this is a six mil uh, that we place down. It's gotta be all the way around it. S make sure that you uh, check with your local building inspector because this comes in both black and clear. And uh, I have, I've put down black and then I've had the building inspector come back and tell me that he need is he needs clear put down uh, so that I make sure so he can see all the gravel that's going underneath it. So we got to put four inch minimum gravel across through here to get a good base on it. And then we're going to put this uh, this uh, PVB in here between the gravel and the concrete. And so I've been called out on that. Now I've done this a hundred thousand times, black hundred times. Uh, and then one time they call me out on clear. So, you know, I think it all really boils down to the building inspector that you have. Uh, either you're going to have to pull back the black plastic. And that's what I did. I pulled back the plastic to show him that I had uh, gravel underneath it. Uh, even though I had to pull up some of my woven wire mesh to get the plastic pulled back. So if you go with clear, then he can see through that and he can see the gravel. Uh, and then, you know, you've got your rebar all lined up on the top of it, ready to go. So now that you understand that, let me go back to that picture that I had. Sometimes I get a little carried away sometimes. So we, we were talking about the, uh, the isolation footing and this is again this is five by five by five and these are so huge uh due to up uh, uplift rather than you know bearing i mean yes we're we're wanting to bear it some but these are huge so that these don't just up and lift away during a hurricane or something and in that we put uh j bolts uh or anchor bolts in there uh, embedded in the concrete that stick up out of the concrete so that when we put our beam on here, uh, you know, hopefully, dear God, hopefully these holes line up. How do we get that to line up? Basically, what you want to do is take you a piece of plywood and, uh, you know, you want to match the holes that are on the bottom of your, of your beam there. 
And then when you go to put these up, basically you put your J bolts through these holes and set it down into the concrete and, uh, you know, make sure that the plywood, you know, rests easily. So, uh, you know, you don't want it to sink. The, the, you don't want the wood to sink down it because the wood's got to come off. We cannot leave any wood in the footings at all, period. And a lot of times I've seen that in the past when they do a continuous footing, uh, then they will sometimes use wood stakes driven into the ground uh, to, uh, to use as a, a height, a, half, a depth rather, a depth meter for your concrete. Well, all wood has to come out. So if you're gonna do any type of depth meter in there, this needs to be metal. Most time it is, it's rebar. Uh, two foot long piece of rebar driven one foot in the ground gives you one foot above the ground and uh, you just leave it, don't have to worry about it. But to get these, you need to make sure you uh, build a template on that so that you can, these will work out right. Cause you dang sure don't want to come back later and have to cut new holes in the beam uh, or anything like that. So that the anchors, anchor bolts uh, work out. You know, you, these anchor bolts are usually sticking out of the, out of the concrete inch and a half, two inches. You can take a hammer and bend these very slightly. Now, when I say slightly, I mean slightly. Uh, 16th to an eighth of an inch max. Uh, make sure that when you're, if you're going to hit this with a hammer, make sure that you put the nut on there first and hit the nut. Uh, that way you don't booger up these threads in here and you can't get the nut to go on. So if you put the nut on there and then you can hit it with a hammer and you can move this right or left, uh, front or back, you know, anywhere from a 16th uh, to maximum an eighth of an inch, because remember that this is going to go in there. It'll be at an angle if you get too much in there and then if it won't go down so far and you'll never get that piece of metal to seat all the way down on the bottom, it'll be stuck up in the air and there. That's not good. Inspector won't pass it or anything like that. In some cases, when, uh, you're doing these really, really, really large beams, uh, what they'll do is they'll use two nuts. And uh, meaning that you'll have that footing coming up and then the, the, the top of the, the anchor bolt will be out of there. Well, they'll put a nut down here. They'll put the beam on and then they'll put another nut on top of it. Now, what does this do? Well, because I can, I can move this nut, the bottom nut up and down by turning it, then I, you know, if I didn't get this footing perfectly level, uh, then I can actually use this bottom nut to go up and down with the whole thing and everything's perfect. So I can, I can make slight, uh, adjustments on that so that the, uh, the beam can set directly level on the top of this footing even though, you know, this, this, they're not going to finish this. There's going to be some irregularities on the top of this footing. And uh, so that can, that can always cause a problem on that when you're trying to set that beam. So back to these joints, that isolation joint I was telling you about. Uh, and then we have the, the concentration joints here, our control joint. Concrete is going to uh, is going to crack. All right. So whenever we've got, you know, four inches of concrete in here and a different thing happened, go ahead and close that door for me. Thank you. Then, you know, there's going to be a crack. I mean, you, you've looked all over the sidewalks and, and stuff and old cracks just run wild across the side of it and look ugly. We don't want that to happen. So what we do is we either put a saw or we put a trowel, uh, joint in that to make a weak point in it so that the crack runs directly with that. Basically, we're taking away this cockamamie uh, free-for-all crack here, and we're allowing a crack to go in a straight line and pretend, just use your imagination, pretend like that's a straight line. It's supposed to be a straight line. Uh, so, golly, when I go to fix it, make it worse. Here, my God, we'll fix it this way. That's about as straight as they cut them with the concrete saws. Yeah, probably so. Yeah, probably so. Absolutely. 
uh, you know, they you want them to look good. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about green concrete. And what I mean by green concrete is it means it's not cured yet. It's not any concrete that is less than 28 days old uh, is called green concrete. So uh, this is what happens when you use a, a ruler. I just wish I could look down on the, the drawing pad here and see where my pen is because I kind of got to guess at it and follow it around until I get it right. There. All right. So, you know, you want those to look really nice. The nicer, the straighter they are, uh, you know, there's a difference between good and great and you want it to look good. So how do you get that? A uh, couple of the things, you can do it with a chalk line. You can uh, use a, a piece of wood. I've seen folks, uh, especially when it's wet, you know, you don't want to use a chalk line when it's wet because it'll ruin your chalk line. So what they'll do is they'll lay a two by down here and then they'll take their trowel, uh, their V trowel, and they'll run back and forth to cut that groove in. So remember that we've got several different, we've got, you know, a saw cut, which is probably the most common. Uh, this is generally done a day uh, or at least six hours after the first pour. Uh, six hours after the first pour, this concrete's going to be able to uh, hold up a person so they could they could actually walk across it and do that saw cut you don't want to wait till 28 days oh dear god no because of 28 days you, you have to have a, a diamond cut wheel in here that's going to be uh it's going to take you hours to cut a, a joint in there but while the concrete is still green in other words less than uh 28 days preferably younger the better uh than this joint this saw joint is easier to put in the tooled is uh, put in during wet. And that's what I was saying. They'll take a two by four and uh, they'll put the two by four, they'll lay the two by four down on top of the concrete and uh, then just run their trowel right up beside of that so that they get a nice straight uh, view through there. So let me show you what that trowel looks like. Here we go. This is that trowel right there. A hand groover. All right, that's one of many different types that they have, but you can see how it cuts into that and makes that groove so that we end up with a nice straight joint running through our concrete. Uh, other type of joints that we have are keyed control joints, which is very important when we've got a large concrete that we need to uh, Pour. Let's say that this thing is, we'll say that this thing's 500 feet by uh, 300 feet. This is enormous. And we're not going to be able to pour this at the same time. We're going to have to pour it in sections. So what we might have is a keyed control joint in there. And that just allows, uh, can't talk and spell it. Hell, I can't even spell when I'm not talking control joint. Uh, so what does that, what does that look like? So a keyed control joint is a piece of metal. That allows us to, you know, stop a pour and to, and to start a new pour. And that's all it is. You can take these, you can leave them in, you can take them out. So this is, you know, these are put into place. Uh, as much in a straight line as possible. And, uh, you know, they're held in place by these stakes or rebar. In this particular case, they're they're done by rebar. In this one, they they're using a stake. Uh, either one can be used. Usually it's one or the other. Uh, the stakes are flatter and the holes are a little bit different on this. But so when we're, you know, when we're cutting, when we're cutting, when we're, let's say that we're going to try to pour this one, we're going to start pouring at 8 a.m. And we might get to this point by uh, 11 a.m. I don't know how big, I don't know, I'm just guessing. So we're going to put key control joints up here so that we can start this one at, say, 12. And uh, we can finish this up at 3. 
uh, p.m. And then maybe we're going to start this one uh, at uh, 3 p.m. just as soon as we can. And this won't finish up till 6 p.m. Uh, then tomorrow we're going to start on pouring this side here. So basically that key control joint goes in here. We can pour right up to it. We got our concrete in here. And then tomorrow, the next day, a couple of years later, we can just tap right onto there and continue. And because this key is in here, then it stops us from moving up and down. Uh, so it just eliminates any motion in there. They can move side to side, but they just can't move up and down. You'll see sometimes in, in some of these stores, uh, these might separate a little bit, and that's okay. So they'll come back and they'll fill these cracks with tar uh, or some other type of bituminous material so that uh, critters don't come up and you don't get junk down in them and that kind of thing. Very seldom have I ever seen uh, joints that don't have some sort of control on them. So in this case, we're cutting down through it and it's going to crack. It's going to crack here at the weak point, but then this crack, because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't crack straight, then we don't have any of this heaving going on. Let's say that we have a garage and we're going to pour the, the sidewalk right up, right up to it. Then we're going to drill and put uh, rebar into uh, the garage. We'll say that this is the garage and this is the drive. And we don't have a problem with one of the two of, of these heaving in there either. Now, what caused it to heave? Any type of water that gets underneath it, remember that this is generally about four inches thick. So any water that gets up under here and then freezes, it's going to try to lift up on it and heave and that, that creates a problem on that. Uh, that. Like I say, I have never seen this at all. This is probably a not a very good, actually I have seen this. You know what, it just dawned on me, it, I have seen this. I want to show you this. Um, and then uh, we'll take us a break after I show you this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get on my phone and try to get on here. And I'm going to take and show you my carport in the back. I'm going to let's see get out of there. Stop sharing, and I'm going to turn this mic off. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Am I on here? Yes. Yes, okay. we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. We'll give you a quick tour of the house, kitchen, dining room, stairway. Yes, my handrail is crooked because it's a maple sapling. Our basement, there goes the mischief of the house, Mars. So this is on a second lawnmower sitting right in the darn way. And then, let me see if I can get you down here where you can see a perspective of this. Here, really, raised two inches over the years. Now this was this was built in 1966. 
no rebar whatsoever placed. And that's why I get the separate, and, you know, that's why I get so much rise out of that. I mean, that's crazy. And, you know, we've got, ouch, we've got cars set here, but this is what happens when you don't put any control joints in there. You get all these crazy cracks going wherever they want to. None of this had any kind of control joint on here. None of it had any rebar in it. So it's just, you know, it looks like crap. Now, uh, when this was put in 2010, I believe it was, they, they drilled, they drilled into the, to the to this wall through here, there's rebar in it. So you see that there's absolutely no movement whatsoever. Very little. I mean, you see a little bit of a crack there. But I asked them specifically not to put rebar in here because one day I hope that I can repair all this, tear it out and redo it. So I've already got some movement out here. Notice here, it's almost flush. And then by the time we get to the center here, it's already, we've got a half an inch right there. And this is falling. So over here, it's being raised up from the existing house. But over here, this is falling. Or this is resin. I don't think it is. Because if I go over here to... This column here, you'll notice that there's no change. The column hasn't changed. I should have, uh, I've actually should have done a little bit better job here and isolated this column with the, uh, the patio here because that column supports a huge amount of house. So kind of give you an idea, that column supports all of this kitchen, this is the kitchen that's above here. So this, this column supports all of that corner of the kitchen right there, plus half of the deck in the back. So if we look at this and we just drew a, a line, an imaginary line going right down the center of this porch here, all of the way this way is bearing on this uh, column and that wall back there. And the rest of it is bearing on these two columns here. Same here, draw an imaginary line down through here. Actually, the imaginary line would go down through here, get to that light and then turn. All of this on in this quadrant, all of it is bearing on this column here. Now, even though we put controlled, uh, we put saw lines in here to allow for the movement of the column, and the cracks to run. I got a crack running all the way down through there. It moves over and runs all the way to the house. So even in our, and then again over here, even with our best methods, concrete's gonna crack. And that is one of the huge uh, things that we that I put on all of my plans is, you know, you can't help you can't hold the contractor uh, liable for these cracks that are going to uh, uh, happen in the concrete. Regardless, now let's go in the in the garage here and look and see if we've got any cracks in here. Actually, no, I'm not even going to look in there. It's a mess. I can't get to nothing. While I'm at it, I want to show you something. So. This is a concrete floor under here, and I know that I'm getting off on wood a little bit. So wood expands and contracts. I've got this huge area that goes from here all the way out to there. And we decided to run the, the wood this way. I wish I hadn't done that because this is what happens. When we fire this booger up and it's running right now, then it dries out this floor and has shattered it. And there's actually a couple of places where it's done that. 
mostly where there's beams. So I've got a, a beam here, or I've got a post here. And you can see how it's separated here. Now these will close up somewhat in the summertime, but here we've got a picnic, a, a picnic table, a pool table, which is very heavy. And you'll have a problem with, with the joints here as well. So I wish we had run the, the floor in a different way. There's kill me. Okay, guys, let's take us about 10 minutes and uh, we'll meet back here at uh, 131. Resume recording. All right, so let's finish up on this concrete joints. So uh, we have a manufactured concrete joint, uh, which you see here and here. So these are put in place where you might have uh, like a bridge to a building uh, where you might have a little bit more movement that, than expected. Uh, and so if you'll notice, this is hinged on one side here, it's connected over here, but it's free over here. So this little uh, transition is going to stay with this piece of concrete, but this one can move a little bit and uh, this will still allow for like wheelchairs and so forth. One thing to note when you're talking about a wheelchair, uh, a half an inch is the maximum rise that you can have uh, for a, a wheelchair, meaning that, uh, you know, if you're in a wheelchair going out through here and you've got a concrete like is in my garage down there, you've got a half of an inch. Now, if any of you have never been in a wheelchair under your own power, you need to do it. If any of you have my codes class, that's one thing that you have to do. You've got to get in a wheelchair and there are certain uh, points of interest that you have to, uh, you have to go to on campus and let me tell you what, when you hit something a half an inch, uh, little wheel, big wheel, uh, it don't matter. It's, it's going to stop you. Half an inch is like trying to climb a mountain in a wheelchair. So these little transitions like this really help out uh, when, you're, when you're doing, uh, when you're in a wheelchair. So, you know, uh, I, I highly uh, recommend that uh, if you haven't already get in a wheelchair and uh, see how this does to you. And this particular one, they're both actually anchored, but then we have a piece of rubber here that uh, moves around a little bit. You see this a lot in DOT bridges, like on interstate highways. Uh, and that's why, you know, you're going across blah, 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 and those are -tunk -tunk. you've run over this thing. And because they're not perfectly lined up, but that little piece of rubber there still allows for it, then, uh, oh, you know what? It just reminded me. This type here, go down uh, Amboy Road, I believe it is. I can't. Uh, there is one that needs to be fixed badly. And I'll tell you where it is. So let's, I'm down here in Morden. Let me fly over here to Asheville. Man, I wish it would take me about this long to get to Asheville when I have to report to class. Amboy, Meadows Road and Amboy Road, that bridge right there. If uh, if you have recently went over this little bridge right there, it's loose. That on this side, this piece right here, it is loose and uh, it just makes an awful racket. But it's this type, this similar type here uh, where it's anchored on one side. And I don't know what's going on, but uh, when you run across it, it sounds like the whole bridge is getting ready to collapse on you. 
So it can be a little bit uh, nerve wracking if you've got some PTSD going on there. Let me think for a minute. Uh, so I talked about, I'm having to go back a little bit. Okay, I think I've got all of those. Let's talk about some of the concrete tools that we use. Uh, one of the first things that you're going to see is a rake. This is a concrete rake, and uh, it has a flat side down here for uh, pushing and pulling the concrete back and forth so that you can get it fairly flat. And then you'll notice it's got a little tab on the top here. And it goes back to uh, when we were talking about that uh, woven wire mesh that was in the concrete. So we're, we're pouring a pad and we've got that woven wire mesh that's in there. Remember that it was laying on the ground here. And so basically we just take that handle and uh, turn it over that's got that little, little ta uh, tab on the top of it. We just turn it over and we grab this and we pull it up. It, it needs to set somewhere in the middle of this concrete. So if this is a four inch concrete slab, this needs to set somewhere around two inches uh, so that it, it has a proper uh, workability on this. If you get it too far close to the top, then uh, you're going to have to grind it down and it makes a mess. It doesn't look good. So you want to make sure that it doesn't peek out the top of the surface. And then, uh, you know, if you get it down too low, then you could possibly have some rust issues and stuff going on there. I'm going to leave this one drawing here. And then we'll come back and talk about that in just a minute. Some of the other tools that we have along the way uh, are a bull float. And we have different types of bull floats. Get rid of that. We have different kind of bull floats. We have the, the big bull float like I just showed you. And then we have what's called darbies. So a, this is a kind of a darby here. A darby is a float uh, that is a handheld float. So as we're pouring this concrete here, we're trying to get these little low places in here. We're, we're aiming for, and I gotta play with my ruler so that I get right here. We're aiming for this. But when that concrete goes in, you know, you're gonna have stuff like this. So you're gonna have to try to pull some of this and put it here so that we end up with a nice straight level surface through all of that. And that's what that bull float and the Darby do. Uh, so, you know, here's a man working a bull float and these handles can get extremely long on that. And they, they're basically just, uh, just pulling that. Actually, I guess I need to talk about the screed first. The screed, you can see uh, we're basically, and this, the, this guy here is either gonna be sliding it back and forth or he's going to be doing a, a, a jitter. He's going to be, you know, just jumping it down through here. And what he's trying to do, you see this void here? Let me, let me blow this up a little bit. Uh, you see this void over here? So that means that's telling him that we need to get some more concrete there. So they're going to take a shovel or, or uh, maybe they're a rake or something. They're going to uh, pull some of this concrete over into this direction so that we get, you know, all of this concrete fairly level here. The, uh, this screed is going to be run across a couple of, so let me get a different color here. This screed is going to continue on and somewhere over here, generally what we do is we have pipe that run level. We've got them uh, on a, uh, a piece of wood that has been driven down in there. It's just basically we take a, we take a long piece of wood and we'll cut angles in it like this. And then we have stakes that we can drive in the ground and we can elevate these, these pipe in here. And then they'll just put a nail on either side of it to hold it in place so that it doesn't move. And there'll be another one over here on this side as well uh, to, to keep this side nice and level. And as he goes down through there, like I say, he's either going to be going back and forth. Most of the time they go back and forth. These are, you know, these boards are a lot longer than what they need. 
<clears throat> but let's say let's say there's a wall here, and this the you know this this wall goes straight down through here, and he can't really do the the back and forth method. What he is going to do is he's going to do the jitter method, where or juking as it's called sometimes. Uh, it's gonna he's just going to go up and down the very small motions down through here to uh, to get this to settle in. That's all he's doing. And then we're going to do the bull float. Bull float. Sorry, I got off on that. So in the bull float, uh, he's basically uh, one of the first things that he's doing is he's trying to get these aggregates um, to go down below the surface. So again, he's trying to make a smooth surface out of this thing, and he's trying to push these aggregates in here below the surface, and we're wanting to get slurry. Slurry, we're wanting to get slurry up to the top. Now, slurry is basically uh, just sand and uh, concrete, uh, or cement, rather. Uh, so there's no uh, large uh, aggregates in the slurry. Uh, so this we get up to the top, then we can smooth it out and get work it down a little bit better and 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 a little bit better. So uh, let's see. No, I need to be right there. Uh, so the bull float and this Darby right here do the exact same thing. The Darby is generally used along these edges. So a man could stand here uh, or woman and they can smooth these edges with the Darby. And then because he has this big long pole here, then, you know, this fellow here can get way out of the way here and he can run this all the way down the concrete and all the way back. I have seen these as long as uh, 50 foot long. Uh, these are aluminum poles. They're about two inches in diameter. Uh, and so they screw together. And so he can run down through there uh, and, and push all of that aggregate down really nicely. So after we get through doing the bull float and the Darby, then we're going to be going to uh, trowels, finishing trowels, midget trowels, and uh, combination trowel blades. So this goes on a machine uh, that like, well, like what you seen a minute ago. So we've got the, you know, the stand up method, single use method. It's got a great big fan on here. And uh, this is probably a better one to show you. So these are adjustable. Uh, this goes around at the same speed. Uh, you don't have a really much of a change in speed except for the throttle on it. But by turning this handle right here, then these actually can tilt. So uh, let's say that we're, we're running across our concrete here and we have that blade. In the beginning, we are going to have that blade a little bit more of an angle like this. And then as this becomes harder, then we're going to dial that sucker down to where she's dang near just smooth through here. And this is a long process. So we're first going to pour it and then we're going to walk away for about it. Well, we're going to pour it. We're going to screed. We're going to bull float. And uh, or Darby, and then we're going to wait. Uh, we're going to wait for probably an hour to two hours, somewhere in that neighborhood. And we're going to allow this to harden a little bit. And then we're going to come back uh, with just around the edges with a hand trowel. Make these look really nice. Uh, and then we're probably, you know, three hours plus later, 
then we're going to be able to walk on it and we're going to start doing the big trowels here. Uh, so we're either we're going to be using one of these bad boys or we're going to be using one of these. Hopefully we can use one of these things. This, this whole thing rides nothing more than on these, on the same thing that we had here, but two of them going in opposite directions. And so he can maneuver this thing just pretty much like a helicopter. So uh, if this thing is, if, if this thing is turning in this direction here, then on, <coughs> if he wants to go, how do I, how do I explain this? So we've got a fan on either side and this one's turning in one direction. This one's turning in another. <coughs> and my handles, if I want to go in this direction, then this one is going to tilt to where it puts more pressure on this side. And this one's going to tilt the opposite so that it puts more pressure on this side and makes the whole machine go in this direction. So if I want to go forward, it's going to, I'm going to have more pressure here and here, and that's going to make it go forward. If I want to go in reverse, I'm going to put pressure on the outsides. But then front, or excuse me, side to side is going to be a little opposite. And these machines do it automatically. You don't have to cr do crazy things with the, with the uh, maneuver, or with the levers. But so this is how they drive that thing. And it just, you know, again, he's got a little knob here that he can change the pitch on these blades and you can see where they went back and forth and back and forth and, back. and he'll go over this thing time and time and time and time and time again. Uh, these type here have a little uh, water thing on them so you, you can actually add water uh, to it to, to make it smooth. So if the concrete is, is drying, which is a bad thing, uh, then he can add water back to this to make it better. If there's no water on this at all, he's going to be uh, blackening the concrete <coughs> and he's going to be wearing his blades out. So you want a little bit of water on there for lubrication purposes and to really get this to work very good. So what you're trying to do here is you're trying to take this little place here, the top surface of this thing, just that top surface there. And what you're doing is compressing it. You're going over it again and again and again and again. And this becomes super hard. So this is a way to get this very hard and very smooth. Uh, so we're starting off with, you know, with our big stuff up here, which, you know, that's what the screed and the bull float, well, the screed gets it level the bull float pushes down these aggregates here to get them below the surface. And then our hand trowels and motor trowels are going to be pushing even smaller pieces down further. We're going to add a little bit more water to get some more slurry. And this is going to be super hard across the top and have a really nice finish. The more we trowel, the smoother it's going to get. Now, what if we're outside like on a driveway and we don't want smooth? Smooth would not be good on a driveway, you know, that has an incline on it. And we have a lot of those in, in Western North Carolina. You know, if we had something really nice and slick, every time it rained, that old car would be, you know, trying to go up the hill there. And instead of going up the hill, what is a sorry looking car? Instead of going up the hill, he's going to be going down and that's not going to be too cool. So what we do is we, we do a brush on that. So there's that concrete finish brush. And these, uh, they come in different lengths. I think the maximum is about four foot wide. And so if, if we're trying to work on this uh, pad here, then we're going to be making brush strokes in this direction so that we get good traction. We can do this on a sidewalk too, uh, because we don't want our exterior sidewalks to be too terribly slick. And so this makes it look, really look good on that. So we have other type of uh, trowels as well, and these are called edgers. So when we're pouring concrete, you'll know that uh, it leaves kind of a sharp edge on it. Okay, so we, we have our form board up here. When can you take a form board down? 
about a day after it's, you know, about the next day, we've got this concrete up there that's here. And so we pull this form board off and that leaves a very, very sharp point right there on that end. And that can hurt people. Uh, it can, you know, if things hit it, then we could break it off and that's not gonna look good. And so what we have to do is we have to catch that before all of that happens. And we want to, uh, you know, put an edge on it. And it's just a round over is what it is. And it just makes a nice smooth uh, edge on it for that concrete, it doesn't break off. It won't allow it to break off. And then it also looks good if we step on it with bare feet or fall on it or whatever, it's not gonna cut us. Now I have, uh, I have always been taught that if you see that mark, you're doing it wrong. So uh, let me see, side walk marks. Sidewalk joints. There we go. Okay. Uh, like I say, I have always been taught this is great. This is the way it should be. This is not great. This is wrong. Like I say, this is what I've always been taught. This is the wrong way to do that. If you if you do this, you need to go back over it with that broom and take that edge away completely and totally. So there's the difference between good and great. This is great. That's good. It's, well, actually, it's not good. It's bad. Uh, but this is the way that they all should look. You should not be able to see that at all. And the reason for that is, and this is actually, let me go over here to the, where's the side one? Well, there's the side one. So you're seeing the side mark as well as the control joint in there. And so which one did they do first? Obviously, did the, they did the, the edger first, and then they come back with the side, the uh, not the the um, joiner, okay? So that's not cool. You shouldn't see those at all. Work, uh, walking across this barefoot, that's gonna hurt, not gonna feel good. So try not to allow that to happen. And so what's happening is, you know, this edger here, when they're going across through there, then, you know, they're pushing down too hard and you're getting a groove right there on from that edger. And that's not, that is what you don't want. Is that, that, that would look, that looks ugly. These are just, this is just a connection for this. Uh, different trowels are used for different things. Uh, mortar mixer, you're going to get to do that. Uh, a mortar hoe, you get to basically what's the difference in a regular hoe and a mortar hoe is it's got these little holes in it. Uh, we'll, we'll be using those. Now, what do they have the five gallon bucket in here? If you get concrete on all of this stuff here, the only way to get that concrete off is water. So a five gallon bucket with, of water is very handy to have on site. What does a rub brick do and a float, uh, a rubber float do? The, the rubbing brick is going to go back over to that, uh, remember that, well, let's see, let me go back over here. Do, do, do. What do I call that? Sidewalk uh, edgers? No, that's not what I call it. Oh, I guess if I spelled sidewalk right. I believe it was joint. Yeah, there you go. Sidewall joints. So, you know, that rubbing brick is for that crap. All right. So Leroy was out here and he, he left all this crap and the homeowner don't like it. So uh, the contractor is going to give Leroy that rubbing brick and he's going to have to go through here and grind some of this down. If he's smart, he'd get an electric grinder. But this is what we used before the electric grinder. Now, the rubber float 
hold on to that one a little bit because I'm going to come back and talk about that. And uh, I'm going to talk about that when we get into brick as well, as well as the masonry brush. Okay, so let's move on to uh, brickwork a little bit. And in brickwork, we have a ton more tools uh, that we have to deal with. Forget about this hawk. Don't don't even uh -uh, don't even pull that up in brickwork. You're not going to see that. Uh, so to start off with, you're going to have all of these nice, pretty trowels, and the uh, the bigger the trowel generally is, the bigger uh, the masonry that we're working with. So if we're doing uh, masonry block, if we're doing CMUs, then we're going to be using a big trowel. If we're doing brickwork, we're going to be using a smaller trowel. Uh, these trowels are probably my favorite ones. Marshalltown are, is a great trowel. This is a, a CMU trowel. It's probably about 11 inches from point to heel. And that means that I can get a whole handful of mud on there and uh, put it down on the block so that I get a, you know, a, I can do less work. Now, it's, as I'm getting older and arthritis starts setting up a little bit more, uh, then I might be having to switch down to a, a brick uh, trowel because I just, my wrists will not take it anymore. These are pointers. This is a pointing trowel, and I'll explain about that. Uh, edging or marginal trowels and then joiners and so forth. So uh, let's see. Let's keep on. Can I go to Marshall, Marshalltown? Let's see what I get to Marshalltown. So we've got, uh, we, we've used these type of trowels, the finishing trowels in concrete. Uh, this type of trowel, we can put a, uh, we can put a nice uh, concave uh, or convex uh, edge on the top of a concrete wall. Never, never, never leave an exposed concrete wall, whether it block or brick. Uh, when I say exposed, like, you know, a wall that's going to be out, not that's going to have a house on it, but just, you know, a brick wall that's running out a garden wall. So I'm trying to think of a garden wall, never have a flat surface on a garden wall ever. Uh, you, you'll end up catching water and it freezes and busts and makes a terrible mess, looks terrible. Uh, so put some sort of either a slope on it, uh, a uh, gable on it, or some sort of convex shape like this on it. Well, shoot. Okay, so uh, let me just go ahead and start talking about a pointing trowel. So you've got several different types of, of pointing trowels, uh, tuck pointers. So this is about the same width as a uh, joint. And then you have, you know, round ends, you've got sharp ends. And so what that means is uh, when we uh, tuck point, all right, so you can do the bag method. All right, so basically we're trying to fill in places in our joints where we didn't get enough mud in. We can do the bag method uh, or we do uh, the trowel method. So this is that tuck pointer that I was telling you about. Uh, there's, a, there's a better view of it. So he's taking that, uh, he, you can use a hawk. You can use a trowel and he's got a little bit of mortar on there and he's just tucking it in there. And that's why we call it tuck point. Um, then we can also use just, uh, well, I'll just have to wait and show you how to do that. I don't know how that I can take a picture or, or other than a video to show you how to tuck the mortar in there like that. Uh, how do you get that in there? Number one, you don't put it on the, the top of the trowel. You put it on the bottom of the trowel. Uh, it's just kind of hard to show you in a picture. And I'm not going to go through that. That's way too much. Okay, so uh, that's what the, you know, that's, you've seen how that works. You can do the same thing with these type, and I'll just have to show you uh, in person during one of our labs for that. Why would this have uh, round points on it? Anybody?
How about a swimming pool? So if you're using a trowel like this and you were trying to do a swimming pool, give me the picture. Then these are going to be, you know, because it's a curved surface, these are going to gouge into it. So when you're when you're trying to do a, a curved or surface or like swimming pool, then you want a, a, a rounded edge trowel on it. So another big thing in masonry is the mason line. So mason's line, we're going to be using mason line as well, and it is a must in our projects, and we're also going to be using uh, line blocks. So the simplest, most efficient one that I know of are these type here. Just the, you know, just I can make those. Uh, they'll give them away. You know, anytime you go to the to the supply house, the Marshall Town stamps. It's kind of like a business card. So they will give these away. All you got to do is ask. The plastic types, of course, you're going to have to buy. Uh, these will not swell uh, when it rains. Uh, or gets wet. So, but you know, like I say, they give these away, you can get hundreds and thousands of them. I have never in my life used one of these type here, uh, but now line blocks come a dime a dozen. There's, there's, you know, everybody's trying to invent a new mouse trap, but this is uh, a line block on that. I want to open up, I'm going to hit this in just a minute. Uh, Actually, I just want to open that up in a new tab because I want to talk about that. Uh, so the the line blocks just hang on to the edge of your, your first masonry. So when we build masonry walls, we're going to start with a corner and then we're going to fill in in the, in the middle of it. And we work to that line. So as we go down through here, we've got that line that we can, we don't touch it, never let the, the brick touch it, but, uh, you know, there's just a little bit of air through here, but this helps, you know, we can get a lot more work done quicker because we're not having to have a level all the time. And uh, like I say, the, you know, these line blocks, they're, they're a dime a dozen, everybody's got a better mouse trap. Uh, tons and tons and tons of different ways, but uh, you know, a lot of the people that I know of go right back to this, uh, to this wooden line block. Uh, in one of the videos with Mike Hassan, Haddon, uh, he talked about a story pole, I believe it was. Uh, and uh, let me see if I can find that. There's some other adjustable line blocks. I personally have never figured these things out. I, I don't know why. I just, uh-uh. Let me go up here and do another search. Okay, so the masonry corner pole, uh, I think Mike Hassan talked about that, and, and these uh, are set up ahead of time, and then it has a little me uh, a little mechanism that attaches to these corners. You can do inside corners. That's the good thing about it. You can do inside corners, uh, and you can do outside corners with these. So they make a really nice uh, uh, addition to this, and... You know, you can run through uh, with a, in, in this particular type, it has these preset holes in there that are eight inches apart. So we can set these up uh, ahead of time with a laser level and we can get all of these holes to line up perfectly. And then that way we just pull strings out through there and we can run with this. We don't have to worry about going back and every third or fourth course that we have to try to worry about, are they level? So. Uh, these are really nice to, to use. I personally ha don't use them, uh, never have, uh, but you kind of get an idea how they work. We can do two lines at the same time. Now, number one reason I've never used it is because I'm never on a, uh, I'm never on a crew that is more than just one or two people. So, um, Okay, so Josh goes over that bridge multiple times a day. Sorry, I didn't just now seen that. Uh, so, you know, 
when you're putting up a Walmart, a Dollar General, or any of these others that go up in a day, then this is probably the preferred method. You're using this. You go ahead and preset those. You can put use multiple lines on them, and you've got 100,000 people out there going at it. Uh, most time, the three of us, me, myself, and I, are working on a job, and, and I'm doing it all. So I just don't have uh, the need for these. But you can kind of see how they work. Uh, these also can be attached at the top with, uh, you know, braces that go back here so they don't move. And they, they, I'm sure that they do a really nice job. I've just never used one. So I wanted to talk about these little boogers here. What in the world is that? This is called a twig. Notice here a line twig and line pins. So what is a line twig and a line pin? Um, so a line twig, let's start with that one. Uh, again, you know, these, these line twigs are, uh, the line twigs are, they, they're stamped, generally they're stamped with something. Where do I see that thing? There it is. You know, and again, they give them away free. This is just a piece of metal. So a line twig, why does it have the name twig? Well, because we started out grabbing a green twig and stuffing it between the bricks uh, in this fashion. And then you'll notice that it has this little place for a line to run through it. And so this is what, uh, let's see if I can find a better picture. Probably not. Nope. Golly, come on. Well, shoot, they go into brick like this right here and they hold the string. So let's say that we have an inside corner to do and we don't have uh, anything for a, a block, a wood block to attach to. So we can use these twigs. Again, when I was in business, when I was doing block work, I would gra grab a leaf, uh, a blade of grass, uh, a green twig, and just bend it over and hold, uh, hold it in there. And at the end of the job, I throw it away. Uh, so, you know, these, these do their job. They're hunky-dory fine. I probably wouldn't go out and buy any, uh, even though, I, you know, there's 14 of them for $3.99 because I can go down to the supply house and buy a new one, or, or they can uh, give me them uh, that's got uh, Marshalltown or Old Castle or something stamped on them. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't have to have those. Uh, I can use a peg or anything. So what about, uh, what about these masonry pegs? What does a masonry peg do? Pretty much the same thing that the twig does, except we got to wrap the rope, or the, the string around these and you notice it's got a little, it's got some little grooves on here so the string don't slide out of it. Uh, so these are really cool too. Again, they give them away, Robinson Brick Company out of uh, Greenlee uh, with his phone number on it. You can probably get those all day long for free and uh, they work really well. And it eliminates some of this stuff. Uh, and then I've done this a thousand times too. You know, if nothing else, put you, put you a nail in there uh, but that's what a, uh, a line peg or a twig eliminates is these nails because, you know, the nail is this thick. Are you going to go above the nail? Or are you going to go below the nail on the string? Make sure you do the same thing on the other side or the string's not going to be straight. And so the line, uh, the twigs, I love a twig, uh, but the pegs can be used as well. The, twi the, the twigs just make your life a whole lot easier when you're, when you're using those boogers starting to get hoarse again. Yapping and yapping and yapping. Trying to think what I've missed. I don't want to have to back up anymore if I don't have to. Let 
Well, doggy, let's talk about let's talk about brick joints before I go to the tools for just a minute. Brink. Try it again, Charlie. Here we go. These are the different types of joints that you're going to have in brickwork. Uh, the concave and the weathered are probably the most common. Uh, the concave, the weathered, uh, the V, they're going, and, the, and sometimes the flush, they shed water, okay? So, <clears throat> concave, which ones are the better ones? Concave, V, weathered, and flush are the better ones because they, they uh, get rid of the water. So, you know, if we've got, if it's raining, uh, then the water is not going to puddle like it would here or here or here. Definitely here and definitely here. I really like the look of a raked uh, brick joint, uh, but uh, you, you'll find out that they, they hold water and when water gets in here, freezes, and then this starts deteriorating and busts off. This is that, uh, this is the convex, what was, what did they call it? Uh, extruded. So this is an extruded. There's a good example of uh, not having a control joint. This is uh, extruded, sorry, brain fart. This is flush, even though it's not perfect. This is a sorry job for a brick job. This is flushed. This is concave. And you know, how did we end up with a concave? Well, we just took our finger and run down through it. That's basically what happened. That's over that and that. Mm -mm. That would probably be on the inside of the wall. That I don't know anybody that would do that. That just to me is ugly. That's what you see when you take down the wall around the chimney. There you go. That's exactly right. Or you take the you take the CMU down without taking the veneer down first. Or I'll tell you where I've seen it is under my office. My office is. Uh, on piers, on concrete uh, or CMU piers, and then it has a brick fill between it or a brick curtain between it, and that's all over the inside of that thing. And they just didn't care because it's not going to be seen. I'm going to try to show you some of these others. I've heard a lot of people say that they love the grapevine joint. Um, I'm not a fan. I don't know. That's the grapevine joint. I'm, I'm just not a fan of the grapevine joint. Um, that's a, this is an inverted grapevine. Still not a fan of it. There's the grapevine. beaded or inverted grapevine, flush. So you can get different effects uh, by this too. Uh, so not only do you get effects from the uh, joints, but you can get, you can make effects by the brick too. So let's call, let's talk about something called corbeling. I don't know if there's two L's or one, corbeling. So in corbeling, when we lay a brick, we'll have a brick wall, and then we're gonna, our next layer, we're gonna protrude out a little bit, and then uh, on the next one, we may protrude out a little bit more, and then we're gonna protrude out a little bit more, and then we may inset, and then we're gonna protrude out, uh, sorry, we're not gonna go back. We can go 
long distances here where we can only go a half an inch in this direction. And we can do that. We can do all kinds of really neat stuff like that. And by doing carb corbeling jo joints, masonry corbeling, you get all these beautiful different effects in there. I love stuff like that. That, you know, this is what is called as a dental tooth uh, corbel. Uh, this is also another modified dental tooth corbel, but uh, just, you know, and what do you, what do you notice there? You notice the brick, right? What else do you notice? Let's, let's go back over to this one. What do you notice? It's not so much the brick, but it's the shadows that, that people are going for. So when you're corbeling brick, it creates a shadow. So like over here, you can see sunlight on this side where you don't see any sunlight on this side. And it is a huge uh, uh, effect, uh, uh, optical illusion, I guess you could say. And some of these buildings just look fantastic. Again, there's this is far off. Uh, so if you put your hand over this side over here and you're not looking at it, then what you're doing is your eye is being paid attention or being drawn towards that shadow that's running out through there. And, you know, man, this stuff, some of that stuff is just gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Look at some of your old buildings downtown. Uh, you'll find that they have uh, a lot of corbeling going on there. Matter of fact, that one looks like that little church down there on... Uh, near AB Tech in um, Biltmore Village. Uh, look at that church, shoot, yeah. Matter of fact, let's take a look at that right quick. See if we can, see if we can. So here again, we'll take another flight over to, to Asheville. Man, that would be so wonderful to be able to get there that quick. Beam me up, Scotty. I'm going the wrong way. Yeah, there it is. No, that's the that's the hotel, isn't it? All uh, right, there's where I'm looking for. No, it ain't either. Where in the heck am I? The bank. Yeah, that is the church. That's where I want to be, right there. So we've got a little bit of we've got a little bit of corbeling going on there around those windows, but they've got you know they're doing they're going even a step further and uh, doing rock and brick and then the tile Spanish tile on there as well. Down here we've got some brick and concrete going on there. Very versatile uh, type of of architecture there for sure. Very cool. Let's go on down downtown here and let's see. Let's see what we got here. A little bit of corbeling, not much. These are these are uh, called capitals, and this is called a keystone. Grand Bohemian Hotel. Let's see what we got here. Come on. Give me. No, yeah, well, this is what is called, this is called a roll lock. And let me explain the roll lock while I'm thinking about it. I'm glad I, I came across that. It is a way to shed water. So uh, when we're doing our brick, then we're going to take a roll. So when we take and put a brick on its end and you're looking at the end of it, this is called a roll lock. Roll lock course. So we're putting a, a roll lock course here when we put a window up so that we shed water away from the building there. And that, that's what that roll lock is. 
Um, you have soldiers, sailors, headers, uh, all sorts of different little things. There's another, there is a, a keystone. Uh, so the keystone uh, actually came about so we could actually stack this stuff in here dry. And that's what they did a lot of times. Uh, and then by putting a large keystone in here, the weight of this pushing down pushes against either side of this arch here and holds it all together. So, you know, basically what we could do is we go through here and we get some sort of support here, put our dry stack up, put the keystone in. Once we put that keystone in, we can pull our support away and it's not going to fall. This was a pretty common type of uh, corbel here in the 50s, 40s and 50s. I lost it, went too far. And basically, so what you put a sign here, that's all it is. It really wasn't there to create any effect. This was, he probably didn't have a whole lot of money. There's another uh, roll lock. You got that roll lock here, you got a roll lock here. Uh, so that gives you that idea of what a roll lock is. Mose. What about the Mickey D's? Nah, it's not even masonry. Let's go downtown uh, to some old buildings. Ooh, what the heck there? How do we get away from this? Go up. And it's not going to come back on. Mission Hospital. Let me get some of these older buildings downtown. Patton Avenue. Let's just let's go down Patton Avenue here for a minute. Okay, we've got some. Uh, concrete going on in there we've got look at this header here it's kind of hard to see but you'll see that they've taken and i believe this is called a sailor uh i forgot my which one's which the soldier and the sailor i think the soldier maybe that's a maybe that is a soldier soldiers are in line you're looking at the side of them a sailor is facing you I, i'll talk about that in just a second This god awful hotel up here. I've had to do some. I've had this is owned by Dr. Patel, and I don't know how many times I've drawn that damn thing, and I'm tired of drawing it. I told him if he don't start, he just he hires me to draw them, but then he doesn't do anything. There's a nice corbel, also known as a dental tooth. This uh, I'm a guessing is the back of this building, maybe. I don't know why this little pull down there is. Got a lot of this uh, this Russian uh, influence going on with these little the little pots up here. That's pretty cool. Let's go back there. That is some fantastic masonry work right there. S and W cafeteria. I would have thought that this maybe was the uh, Masonic building or something the way it looks, but I mean, look at that. That's that's just an unbelievable masonry there. Uh, this is all cut stone, by the way. There's some corbels. There's some beautiful corbeling on this building beside of it. I have no clue where I'm at. I'm just a Nashville law firm. You know, there's there is the classic corbeling going on there. That's beautiful. So when the sun hits that at a certain certain what, especially on that curve there too, that's going to really look. Very, very pretty. Let's go on down. I want to get down here to this building way down here. Yes. Well, it's so like put their finger in the way there, didn't they? Or right, that's the, and there's a tree in the way. Look at that one. We've got some uh, medieval arches going on here. We've got some Roman arches going on up here. And then we've got a bunch of nice corbeling going on as well. Different color of brick on this building here. We've got some inset panel 
And then we've got a whole bunch of ornate uh, stuff, some gargoyles on the corners here. Very nice. Bet you didn't even pay any attention to half this stuff before, did you? Let's go up here. Go down. I want to get to this one. That's where I want to be. Well, can I not go down there? I can't go down there. Well, that sucks. Let's see if I can go down another way. I hate these modern looking buildings here. This, I don't know, this just makes me sick. That's about as plain Jane as you can possibly get. And I still can't get to that building there. This one's another building that's, a, that's fantastic. It's beautiful. A lot of, uh, uh, think about it in a minute. Old English architecture, like the cathedrals that you see, the citadels and so forth. Very nice work there. And, you know, we get back to the plain Jane stuff. We got, we got some cut stone. We got some uh, CMUs. We got some concrete and then we've topped it off with brick, uh, probably as an afterthought, maybe, I don't know. Uh, sometimes they go back and they build these parapets on there uh, as an afterthought to hide the uh, air conditionings and so forth in there. Somebody saying something. What about the Grove Arcade, one page avenue? That was a super net looking building. All right, so Grove Arcade. Was I anywhere close to that before? And you don't you don't have to text me. You can chime in and tell me and help me get there because I don't I don't know my way around to Asheville too much. But I you think, were kind of close to it. What is that where they play music and stuff? No, it's near Battery Park, which is uh, off of Patton near the S and W cafeteria building. You were at. Oh, uh, that's not this. It's what? Tell me where I'm at now. Wait a minute. Pull this back up. Okay, so it's back on Patton Avenue, you say? Yeah, it's near where, uh, it's near the intersection of Patton and Haywood, which is near where the drum circle is, Richard Park. Is this what you're talking about? Okay, which building is it? It's a, uh, so Page Avenue is off of Battery Park. Let's see. You're kind of close to it there, where the triangle is. Yeah. It's like kind of a, okay, you can see Chai Pani over there. Battery Park. Battery Park. There's what am Page I looking Avenue, for? a little bit to the left, Page Avenue. That's the building with Carl. Oh, Page Avenue, this building here? Uh, or this? A little bit to the left, that one right there, to your left. Okay, yeah. let's take a look at that one. That's the Grove Arcade. Okay. That one or this one? That one, yeah. Look at there. That's pretty. Cut stone. Got gargoyle faces, it looks like. Beautiful. I've always been fascinated with this building here. I don't know what that is. But, uh, you know, I could... Uh, I had a church that I used to go to as a child and it had those corbels on the corners here. And we used to climb the side of this thing. Can you imagine being Spider-Man just going up the side of that thing? Or living in the penthouse? Crazy. Absolutely crazy. So is this the place to be downtown? I don't know much about Asheville. Not it's really usually pretty popular. Retail. That? Yeah. Only if you're into retail, you want to go buy things. That's, you know, the mall. Oh, is this Rodeo Drive? It's, Bingo. yeah, there's a lot of boutique shops around there. Gotcha. I know my wife's, uh, his tat her tattoo artist is somewhere in this neighborhood. I don't know where though. Uh, that's about all I know of. Let's see. Got a little bit carried away here. 
uh, on Corbling. Back up, make sure that I've covered everything in brick that I need to cover. Oh, jointer, yeah. So the joints, you can get joints on the small hand joints like this, or you can get the larger type uh, joiners. Like that. So this is a hand joiner. You can stick that sucker in the back pocket. And then if you're, you know, if, if you're doing large jobs, you may have a person that bring, he's called a tender, by the way, uh, a tender, uh, you know, he'll mix the mortar, he'll bring you the mortar, he'll bring you brick, and he will, he will joint uh, your joints. So this is the type of joiner that he would use. The mason would have this in his back pocket. There is, this is called a skate and it has a pen, it has a little nail in it. This is how you do a raked joint with that skate. And you've got just tons of different shaped uh, joiners that you can use throughout this uh, process. Let me go back to masonry tools, get a picture, mental picture of anything I've forgotten. Level, absolutely, you know, that's a that's a must. You better have a level uh, whenever you're doing masonry for sure. And uh, you don't have to bring one to class uh, when, we, when we start our lab. Uh, actually, labs will start next Tuesday. And I think we may do a field trip. Uh, on Tuesdays and Thursday of next week to look at some masonry uh, on a uh, on a job that is a former student of mine actually there in Asheville. She's building a, a duplex. Eric, do those labs take place at the same time as this Zoom meeting has been taking yes. place? Yes, yes, sir. So while the other group is doing that field trip, the people who are signed up for the opposite day won't be attending. That's correct. And they won't be Zoom because I can't be in two places at once. Yeah, I may try to do some uh, some recorded videos. Uh, actually, I think I've got some from the last class. Uh, so you know, if you're not in lab, then I'll try to keep you busy. That's for sure. If that's what you're worried about, <laughs> I'll keep you busy. My God. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, you'll either you'll either show up on a Tuesday or a Thursday, but not both. And none either. Try to make to one. Okay, so uh, let's go on to tile. Tile is uh, the finish end of masonry. We won't be doing any tile work. Uh, we will be laying some block and some brick, but we won't be doing any tile work. So in tile, uh, you have a, a mortar and you have a grout. The mortar is what you're seeing here. The mortar is placed uh, with what is called a dental tooth uh, trowel, and that's what this is. And it, it leaves these little gaps in here. And believe it or not, those make that tile adhere 300 times better than if you just smeared it flat. This actually, it, it leaves some air in there uh, so that you get a vacuum and it sucks it to the wall. I have put huge rocks up. I mean, huge rocks uh, up on fireplace enclosures, uh, just using this method here and never had a problem out of them. They, they stick like, like glue. And so the, this type of mortar here, there's several different types out there. Uh, there is a static mortar and then there is a dynamic mortar. So if we, let's say, for instance, this is concrete floor uh, and we could use a static mortar to go uh, here. If this is a wood floor or uh, a floor that uh, is movable, in other words, let's say it's a wood floor, but you put concrete board down or even my bus, for instance. So let's say that I'm going to tile my bathroom on my bus. I'm going to use a dynamic mortar on here that has a little bit of flexibility. I tell you, tile uh, comes in different types. You can have ceramic, uh, you can have slate, 
you can have marble, you can have granite, uh, just all sorts of things. So ceramic is a man-made, uh, and I'm 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 thinking that there's some more uh, out there, and I can't put my tongue on it right now. They used to make them out of countertops, but you can. It's a lighter weight material that actually it has a little bit of flex on it. But for the most part, most tile is super brittle. So, uh, you know, you don't want a whole lot of movement out of there. And, uh, but, you know, you, you still, when you're putting it on wood and stuff, you want this to take the impact and not your tile work. Uh, so you're going to, you know, there's different types of dental tooth uh, towel, trowels out there. Uh, to to make different patterns depending on you know how big or how small your tile is going to be. You might use something like this for 18 by 18 or 24 by 24 tiles. You may use something like this for what's called mosaic tiles, which are like a, an inch to a half an inch uh, in in size. So the smaller the tile, the smaller the the bead that you're going to be using. For most part, it quarter by quarter works just you know pretty well for most tiles between six to one foot uh, square. And uh, so the different uh, tools there are, the main thing is this trowel. Uh, the second one <coughs> is a cutter. And so this is a, um, this is a scribe cutter. So basically it's got a, a like a diamond cut wheel on it. And it, this man is just going down through there and he's scribing the surface of it and then by this little handle here, he's putting it under a bind. So there's, there's, let's see which way it goes. There, uh, there's probably a rod under this rod and there's a rod under this rod. And then this puts just a little bit of pressure in the center of it and folds these two up and allows that just to break right down through there in that soft spot that he made. Much like this one here, uh, this is a handheld version. So you've got a, you've got a tile cutter on, um, you got a tile scribe and you scribe the tile down through there and then just put this little uh, pair of pliers in there. It, it pushes these two apart and breaks it right down through there. If you don't have something like that, you're going to have to use some sort of cutter. This is a wheel, uh, a water cutter. Uh, very nice, makes a big old mess. Um, and believe it or not, you can use your, your table saw for this. I do not have one of these at my disposal, and I do all sorts of tile work around this house. Let's say I have had, I have done all sorts of tile around this house. I try not to do it anymore. I, mm -mm, my knees and, and uh, wrists don't put up with it anymore. But I, I basically put a diamond cut wheel on my table saw, and I use the table saw to cut my tile. Yes, it's dustier and crap. And it does get my table saw dirty. So before I finish or before I start cutting wood with it again, then I'm going to take my air hose and I'm going to blow out everything really, really, really good uh, to get all that uh, that dust out of there because it can it can play havoc on uh, the parts of it. It's not you know table saw is not really made for stuff like that, but it can be. Uh, I use my tools to the max. Uh, so you know when you're doing stuff like Nope, didn't want that. Yeah, when you're using, you know, sometimes you got to go around uh, your fixtures and stuff. And so let's see if it's got a picture there. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to go around a coffee cup. We're going to go. So when we're going around this coffee cup here, uh, you're going to have to take a grinding wheel, like a side grinder. <coughs> That's what I use. I use a side grinder. That's what I did my bathroom with. And I just eat it away. I start making very small cuts, and uh, you know this this works fine. Talk about an extreme floor. That'd be a lot of cuts in there. No, it's not really. It's not cuts. It's just different sizes of stuff on there. So tile work, you can do a great many things. Oh, let me talk about that. This is the coolest little thing right there. It is nothing more than two suction cups. You put this on, you, like your larger tiles, and you have to reach out for a very long place. You you put this on there and push these little buttons down. It, it's got two suction cups on there. It picks up your tile and you can place it <coughs> with one hand. This is a single version of the same thing. These are pinchers or nippers. So when you're, you know, like when I was talking about cutting circles in tile, <coughs> 
you take and and uh, you would cut. So let's say, let me go over here to the whiteboard for just a second. <coughs> let's say we've got a piece of tile and uh, we've got to cut around that coffee cup. So we're going to mark it. And then we may take, uh, I, I probably would, I would take my side grinder and I'm going to make a series of cuts in here. And I'm not going to go all, even though I passed it here, I'm not going to go past this mark here. It's actually going to be, it's going to be more like that. I'm going to be before. So then I can take and I can break these off by my hand and they'll break straight. They always break in a straight line. They'll break out through there. And then I can take those nippers, those end pieces, and I can start whittling away at this until I get to that perfect line there. It takes a little bit of patience, uh, a good steady hand and good eyes. Uh, I, I advise to wear gloves when you're doing this stuff because it gets very sharp uh, and definitely wear eyeglasses uh, or goggles or something when you're doing this because that stuff shatters everywhere, especially if you're using side grinder. Side grinder just throws stuff everywhere. So remember that uh, sponge trowel that I was telling you about? So the sponge trowel is used to put the grout down. And uh, when you're putting these down, you'll see this little spacer here. I tend not to put any spaces. I, I tend to have very small joints. Keep in mind that jo the towel is not waterproof, but most of your tiles have they're either if you if we were to blow them up and look at them they actually have uh, a a v surface to them in other words the bottom of it's going to hit first and the top would never hit or they may have uh, a convex surface and sometimes they have what's called a beaded surface and this just allows, this is basically the minimum joint allowed by the manufacturer. Okay, let's just call it that. So, you know, we've got the, we've, we've used that mortar uh, to put these down with uh, the, the dental tooth trowel. And then we've got to go through with mortar. So, I mean, I'm sorry, grout. So the grout, the grout can be bought sanded and unsanded. All right, so why do we put sanded on there? So when you're doing joints like this, you want to take up space and do sanded uh, joints in there. If we're doing really tight joints, then we're going to use unsanded grout. I don't see any tight joints. Let me just uh, hang on just a minute. I'm going to take you for a ride again.
Sorry, guys. You can hear me now, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry about sorry about that. Well, let's start this again. So here's my tile on my counter, and I have the minimal joint. So these are these are butted up together on the bottom, uh, and it just gives the, the very small joint there. And this joint is unsanded. There's no sand in this. And then I, I'm sealing this to where, uh, and I seal it probably every six months or so, uh, so that I get no bacteria on here. This is a ceramic tile. So the surface of this is very fine porous. I mean, super fine. And then we clean it daily with uh, uh, Clorox wipes or something. But what I was showing you guys here is I've got the glass top stove and by doing so I've got it perfect. Now this is a range. This has got the whole oven and everything and I've just got it leveled out so well so that I can, you know, I can push my, my uh, stove of the pots and stuff off and then I'm going to kill the cat for being up on the counter. Uh, so it works really well. And this was a, uh, a discontinued tile uh, the kitchen is the doors and everything are made out of leftover flooring. Uh, the matter of fact, the, the styles and rails, uh, the doors, everything was made out of, uh, leftover flooring. The, uh, this, these were made out of trees that was cut down in, in, um, in my yard. I had a sawmill at the time, so I could mill all this stuff up. And, uh, so there's my kitchen not talking about appliances, I've probably got about three hundred dollars in and everything here. Maybe more, maybe more if you count all of the the hardware and stuff. So uh, I'm all about building stuff as fruitful as I can, anyway. So tile work can be used, and I think you guys have already seen my bathroom. But again, I just uh, you know I've pulled two different types of, of discontinued tile and use the, the side grinder to cut that. And then it just, it, you know, goes all the way into the, into the bathroom or into the shower. And then glass block is another type of masonry uh, that you can use. These are sealed units, so no water can get inside those. And you use a special glass block type mortar uh, that holds these together. So we ended up, you know, with doing the little glass block curve thing on the, on the shower there. So that takes care pretty much of all the masonry from block work, concrete work, all the way to tile work. Unmute. You'll need to unmute again. You're muted again. Sorry. Anybody got any questions? Okay, I'm gonna shut up. I run my mouth enough today. So um, we will meet back here on Thursday. And then uh, make sure that uh, if you haven't got a, if you've, if you've got a preferable day, send it to me. If you don't have a proper, a, a preferable day, I will take the remainders and shove them in. Let's see one chat thing here. Let's see. Can anyone hear him? Thank you, Austin. <laughs> Keep on me. Okay. Have a great one, guys. Have a good evening. I got one question for you, just separate from. Okay. Uh, just about the uh, uh, interview, the uh, I'm sorry, have I got the back? Have I got my classes backwards? Do you have a You're talking about uh, the interview with an inspector with an elder? Interview with an with elder, that's uh, yeah, that's green building. Yes, yes, that's fine. Go ahead and ask me. Um, I've got an audio recording. Do you need that all transcribed, or do you accept the audio recording? Thank you. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I, I, I like that. That's very good. Okay. Any other questions, guys? You asked a question earlier. What did you want us to answer or what? 
Yes, I do. Yeah, the rod buster. <laughs> That's a rod buster. <laughs> yes, I had a couple of people that uh, sent me a text or sent me a uh, uh, a chat. Yes, that is correct. A rod buster. That is a person who does rebar. Very good. Okay, guys, have a good one. Talk to you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.